Hey, welcome to the Undiscovered Games video podcast, where we take a look at the lesser-known board games of the world and share those with you. Today, we're going back to 2005 with one of my favorite Undiscovered games in my collection. I love sharing this game with people. It's called Euphrates and Tigris Contest of Kings. Now, if you're thinking that sounds an awful lot like Tigris and Euphrates, well, you're correct. This is Reiner Knizia's card game implementation of his famous board game, Tigris and Euphrates. Now, if you follow my YouTube channel or my Instagram page, you probably know I'm a big Reiner Knizia fan and I absolutely love Tigris and Euphrates the board game. It's in my top 10 games of all time, and it was in the top 100 on Board Game Geek forever until recently it got bumped down to 103, I believe. And that's unfortunate because I absolutely think that Tigris and Euphrates is one of the greatest games ever made, and I think it should be in the top 100 easily on Board Game Geek. But I digress. So what's this game all about? Well, just like the board game, you're trying to lead an ancient dynasty to greatness, and you're doing so by playing cards to the table, moving your lead around strategically and you're just trying to generate points in each of the four colors. The four colors represent four facets of your civilization such as population, agriculture, religion, and trade. So if you can do well in all four colors you have a chance to win. As you add cards to the table it's going to generate points in the different colors and it's also going to grow these kingdoms out here. As the kingdoms get bigger they could potentially merge with other kingdoms which may cause conflicts with your opponents. You can even force two other opponents to fight each other or you can cause a revolt within a kingdom if you want to go head to head with somebody. Lots of great old school player interaction here. You know, you really have to read the board. Sometimes it's better to be the aggressor. Sometimes it's better to try to play more peacefully. It depends on how the board develops. You know, how these kingdoms are forming and merging and things like that. What cards you have available to you. So many surprisingly fun and deep decisions to make throughout the game and it's different every time you play. I just find this game fascinating and the board game of course as well because because it showcases Reiner Knizia's genius, his ability to take just simple colors, there's four colors here, and create such an immersive and deep game out of that. It's just a deck of cards, four colors, and you're trying to collect sets of colors. That's essentially what you're doing, but the way you go about that is such an interesting game, and that's a testament to Reiner Knizia as a game designer. Now, before I teach you this game, I want to discuss why I own the card game and the board game in my collection. Do you really need both? Who might benefit from this card game, etc.? This game serves multiple purposes for me personally. First of all, the box is much smaller, so it comes in a very compact box, easier to take with you places. It's also much faster to play. This is a 45 to 60 minute game usually, which is about half the length of the board game. So you still get a pretty similar experience in this card game as you do to the board game. And that brings me to my next point, which is if you've never played Tigris and Euphrates and you've always been curious about it or you want to try it out, I would really recommend starting with this card game for many reasons. First of all, as of now, this is way easier to find on the secondhand market. There's a bunch of copies out there floating around for about 10 to $20, which is what I paid for mine a few years ago. So that could always change, of course. But as of now, this is way easier to find at a good price, whereas Tigris and Euphrates is going to be selling for, you know, sometimes $100 or more. So if you don't want to spend all that money, you can get this card game and just get the feeling of Tigris and Euphrates and also get started developing some strategies because it uses the basic strategy of the game and you get about 80% of what the board game offers. It's essentially the same game. Uh, there's a few key differences, which I'll cover in the video, but for the most part, you will learn what Tigris and Euphrates is all about, and then you can say, you know, if you really like the card game, then at that point, you could proceed into the board game. You might not even need the board game. You might like the card game enough, and that might be all you need, and that's what's interesting is I would rather play the board game personally, but if I had to choose one to keep in my collection, I would keep the card game because I know I can get the card game to the table more often. And that's just been my personal experience with it. Um, I've had plenty of players who do not like the board game, but once I showed them this card game, they're like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll just play that. Like, they enjoy the card game, but they don't want to play the board game. And I don't know why, other than it's a little easier to visualize what's going on in the card game. The colors are better, it streamlines some things, it's faster, and overall, I just think it's less intimidating of a game. And that's cool with me because if I have to, you know, sacrifice a little bit to 
get to play this at all, I'm willing to do that. Because like I said, I can get my Tigris and Euphrates fix with this card game, and other players are happy to play it. So that's my biggest selling point for this. Now, if you already have Tigris and Euphrates, and you have a group that plays it and enjoys it, then just stick with that. I don't think you need this card game also, unless you're trying to get new players you know, into that game. So that's my little uh, two cents on why I think this game is a good addition to a game collection. And now I'm going to get started with the full tutorial. I'm going to teach this game as if you've never played the board game or the card game. I'm going to go over all the rules and I might throw in a few little comparisons to the board game as I go. As always, check the description below for any rules, clarifications, or small mistakes that I may have made in the tutorial. You can comment below with your questions and I'll be happy to try to answer those in a timely manner. After I teach you the game, I'll give you my rating and final review. Now let's learn how to play Euphrates and Tigris Contest of Kings. First, each player is going to choose their symbol that they're going to play as. Remember, you're playing as a symbol and not a color in this game. You can choose from the bowman, or I'm going to call it the archer, the lion, the steer, or the vase. Uh, we'll set up for a three-player game here. We'll use the archer, the lion, and the vase. Give each player their four wooden discs with their symbol on it. There should be one of each color in their symbol, black, red, blue, and green. These discs are called leaders, so anytime I refer to leaders in the video, I'm referring to these wooden discs. Next, separate these four catastrophe cards. They look like this on the front and the back. Give one of these to each player. Any leftovers put back in the box. These are kept out in front of the players, and these are like a one-time use power play card. Next, you're going to find the three ship cards here. They look like this. Set these off to the side where all the players can see them somewhere. Uh, then you're going to find these eight treasure cards. They are red with this golden dragon symbol. Again, there are eight of these cards, and you place them one next to another in a row near the top of the table. You need to leave enough room between these cards for one additional card, so about the width of a card between these, and then you need to have enough room below these treasure cards for seven additional cards. These are going to be columns. The, the columns start at the treasure cards, and you play cards below the treasure cards, so the columns always max out at eight cards. The setup part in the rule book is not very clear on this. Um, some people argue that it means the treasure treasure card plus eight additional cards below that, which would be nine total cards in a column. However, if you read page two of the rule book, it clearly says when a column hits eight cards, no more cards can be added to that. So I take that to mean eight total cards, including these treasure cards. So you need to leave room below these for seven additional cards in each of these columns. These columns are going to represent kingdoms, and these kingdoms will be able to merge with each other, and they can only merge at the top of each column, which is why we leave space between these cards to be able to merge these columns later in the game. And I'll go over all that here in a moment. But first, we need to deal out your starting hand of cards. So you're going to get this deck of cards here. All these cards work the same way. They're just a color. So you're only concerned about the colors on these cards. They're either going to be black, red, green, or blue. Mix all these cards together, give them a good shuffle, and then you're going to deal out eight cards to each player face down. This is your starting hand. You're always going to replenish your hand back up to eight cards at the end of a player's turn. So you're always going to get to start your turn with eight cards in hand. Now it's important to note if you're playing this with two players, you need to randomly remove 30 of these cards from this deck and don't look at them. Just put them back in the box. That's the only difference in gameplay for playing with two players. Otherwise, when you play with two, three, or four players, setup and gameplay work exactly the same. And that's the entire setup. This is a very quick and easy game to set up. Now I want to go over the scoring, because once you understand the objective of the game, how you score points, then I can teach you how to play the game and generate those points. So throughout the game, you're going to be accumulating these cards of different colors to your victory point stack here. And then at the very end of the game, you'll go through your stack and separate the colors and score points. So you don't score any points during the game. You're just adding cards to your pile over here. And the ultimate goal is to have a lot of every color. Now, the way I like to teach this is set collection. I like to teach that you want to have one of every color. That's a complete set. That's a point. So every time you make a complete set, that's one point. Whichever player has the most complete sets will have the most points and they will be the winner. So in this example here, if I end the game with two black cards, three green cards, five blue cards, and six red cards, this is my end game victory point stack here, I get two points because I have two complete sets here and here. 
Now, the rule book teaches this differently. This game and the board game both teach you that whatever color you end up with the fewest of, that's your points. So once again, in my example here, I have the fewest of the black cards, so that's only worth two points. Now, that's fine. That might make perfect sense to you, but I have taught this game to a lot of players over the past seven or eight years, both the card game and the board game. And in my experience, I can't tell you how many times this has caused problems with players understanding their objective in the game. Sometimes players think that, oh, I need to score the least in all these colors. I need to have the fewest of each color compared to my opponents. No, it's just that whatever you have the fewest in, that's your points. You still need to have more points than your opponents. I've had other players think that if they don't collect certain colors, then they get to score the least of just the colors that they collected. And that's not the case either. You need to have all the different colors and then whatever you have the fewest in, that's your points. So again, this is why I like to teach it as set collection. You're trying to get complete sets. A complete set is one of every color. Each time you get a complete set, that's a point. Most points wins the game. Whenever I have taught it this way, and I just started doing this a couple years ago, and I have never had any issues with players understanding how to score in the game. So that's just my two cents. Now, the only time the other way is beneficial is if you need to explain the tiebreaker, because if two players tie for the most points, then you have to look at the color they have the second fewest in, and whoever has the most in that color will be the tiebreaker. So usually with new players, they're not going to be too concerned about what is the tiebreaker and understanding that. But if they need to understand that, then you can explain it the way I just did. But show them both ways, how it works the same way. But it just changes your whole perspective when you think of it as set collection. Now that we have the scoring out of the way and you understand what you're ultimately trying to do in the game, let's talk about how you play the game. It's actually pretty simple from a rules point of view. The complexity comes from the gameplay itself, reacting to the board, reacting to other players and things like that. Players are going to take turns going clockwise around the table, taking two actions each. You can determine a start player however you see fit, and then from that point on, it's just going clockwise. Very simple. So on your turn, you have two actions. When you're the active player, you must take two actions. You can do the same action twice or you can do two different actions. It's totally up to you. You basically have two options when you take an action. You can either place or move your leader, which are these wooden tokens, or you can play a card from your hand to the table. Now, there's another option you have, and that's this Catastrophe card, and I'll go over that here later in the video, but just know that the Catastrophe is a one-time use. It's a one-time action. It's like a power play, and when you use your Catastrophe card, it's out of the game, but that does count as one of your actions. So I like to keep it simple. You basically have two actions to choose from, but you do always have that Catastrophe card as a possibility, just in case you want to play that at some point during the game. Now, your two actions. Let's go over those. One is place or move your leader. So you start with your leaders in your possession here, and placing a leader can simply be take your leader, place it on any open card. You can't place your leader on a card that already has another leader on it, but you can play it on any color card out there. It does not have to match your leader color. You can place your leader on these treasure cards up top. You can place them on any of the cards that have been played. You cannot place your leader on ships. Now, I haven't explained the ships yet, but as these ships come out, you can never place a leader on a ship. And that's all the rules for placing your leader. You can also move a leader, which would be just taking your leader from one card and moving it to any other open card that's already been played onto the table. So very simple rules for placing or moving your leader. The next option you have for an action is playing a card from your hand to the table. Whenever you play cards to the table, you play them in these columns beneath these treasure cards. So you start up underneath here and you just play a card directly underneath the card above it. Now again, the columns can only have eight cards total. So if a column is maxed out with eight cards, you cannot play another card into that column. But whenever you play a card, this is one way to generate points. As I mentioned, each column is its own kingdom. After you play a card, you look inside that kingdom for any leaders that match the color of the card that you played. Now, this is much easier to visualize in an example, so let me set up an example here. It's later in the game, and it's my turn. I am the archer player. My first action, I'm going to take my blue archer leader here, this wooden disc, place this in this column here. This is a kingdom, and this is an available space to place. I could not place my leader here because there's already a leader here, but I'm going to place it on this card here. So now my blue leader is in this kingdom. Now I'm going to take a blue card from my hand and add it to that same kingdom. 
Now, because my blue leader was already in that kingdom, this is going to generate one blue point for me. I add my blue card, and now I also have to have a blue card in my hand, which I get to add to my victory point pile. And this is a key difference from the board game. In the board game, when you add tiles to your kingdom, you just get the points in those colors. You don't have to also have them in your possession. You get them from the supply. In the card game, you have to have a card in your hand that matches that color as well. So you really have to have two cards of the same color to be able to get any points for it. So again, in this example, I add a blue card here. I check for the blue leader. There's my blue leader. I get to score a blue point. So I take another blue card from my hand and add it to my point stack. Now, if another player's blue leader was in here instead of mine, then they would get to score a blue point. But again, they would have to have a blue card in their hand at that point. But let's say I'm the archer, and let's say the vase player has their blue leader here. Now, if I add a blue card here, the vase player gets to score a blue point if they have a blue card in their hand, and they would do that right now. So that's kind of how the scoring works. You place a card and you look for whoever's leader matches that color. You can never have two leaders of the same color in the same kingdom. Again, a kingdom is this column here. This is separate from this kingdom over here for now. These can merge and I'll get into that later. But just know that you're always looking for the leader of the same color. You play that card and that generates a point to that leader, whoever it is, whether it's you or another player. Again, you can never have two leaders of the same colors within the same kingdom. That's going to cause conflicts, and I'll go over that during the conflict section of the video. Now, another thing to note is your leader does not generate you points when you place it. So let's say there's already a blue card there. When I place my leader out here, I do not get a blue point. I only get a blue point after my leader is already there, and then I add a card to that kingdom where my leader is already present. You also, you only get one point per card you add. So if there was already a bunch of blue cards here, so I place my leader out, I don't get any points for these. I add one card here that matches my leader. I don't get to score all these blue cards. I only get to score one blue card for the one I just added. And I just want to be thorough in this because I don't feel like there are very many detailed tutorials even on the board game. The board game works very similar to this and it's a very important to understand how the points are generated in this game. So a very simple basic strategy in this game is just place your leader and then play a matching color card and generate a point. That's a very simple way to get a point in this game in a certain color. Again, it works the same for all the colors. So if I had my green leader out here and I play a green card then I would get to score a green point. But again, I have to have a card in my hand and place it in my point stack that matches that same color. Now, there is a slight difference with the black leader. Now, the black leader is called your king, and he works the same when you add black cards to a kingdom. So if I had my black leader out here, I play a black card, I get to generate one black point. Now, what's interesting about the black leader is he will scoop up any points for other leaders that are not there. For example, if this was the setup, I have my black leader here, I'm the archer player. The other player, Vase, has their blue leader here in this kingdom. So if I add a blue card to this kingdom, Vase gets to score a point. But if I add a green card here, there's no green leader, that defaults to the black leader. So I could add a green card here and my black leader will let me score a green point. Now this is where players start to get lost, so I want to reiterate. Think of the black leader as scooping up all the points that fall through the cracks. So the colors are always going to score for the leaders that match first. Red leader is there, you play a red card, red leader is going to get that point. But if you play a red card and there's no red leader there, then you check to see if there's a black leader there. Whoever's black leader is there will get the red point. And again, you have to have that red card in your hand also to be able to score it. Now this will get a little more complicated as these kingdoms merge. So I'm going to set up an example here. Before I teach you how to merge these kingdoms, I want to show you how this would work. Let's say it's later in the game and the table looks like this, okay? Kingdoms can only merge up here at the top of the board. So this here is considered one kingdom. So if my leader is here, I will generate points in blue for any blue card added to this column or this column because my leader is within the same kingdom. Furthermore, if the board looked like this, this is a single kingdom now. So if my blue leader is all the way over here and I add a blue card way over here, 
this blue leader will still get me a blue point because it's all part of the same kingdom. And once again, you cannot have two leaders of the same color within the same kingdom. So this would not be allowed if my blue leader was here and Vase had their blue leader here. That's two blue leaders in the same kingdom. That is not allowed. You must resolve that conflict. I'll get into that in the conflicts. So let me do one more quick example just to get this cemented in your brain. Let's say the board is set up like this. Vase player has their green leader here. Archer player has their blue leader here. And the lion player has their black leader here. This is all one kingdom. It's lion player's turn. Lion plays a red card into this kingdom. The first thing we do is look to see if there's a red leader present. There is not. So then the red point defaults to whoever's black leader is in this kingdom. So if lion player adds a red card here, lion player gets to score a red point because their black leader scooped up that red point that didn't go to any other leader. Again, they have to have a red card in their hand. So they would take a red card from their hand, add it to their victory point stack. Now, if they did not have their black leader in there and there was no red leader, then nobody would get that red point. The card could be played. You can do that. You can play a card and nobody gets a point. That's fine. And you could still play that red card even if you didn't have a red card in your hand to score. If you wanted to get that red card out there for another reason, you just don't get to score the point for it if you don't have another card in your hand to match to add to your victory point pile. And that is how you generate points using your leaders and adding cards to kingdoms. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below. Now, the rulebook says when you collect these victory points, you're supposed to put them in a stack and the stack is supposed to be kept secret from your opponents and you you're supposed to only see the topmost card of your stack so the way the rules are written you're supposed to remember the colors that you've collected throughout the game and this is very hard and challenging and we usually do a house rule where you're allowed to look through your own pile but nobody else can see what points you have. And I like that way the best. There is a variant in the rule book that says you can play with open points where everybody can look around and see how many points everybody has collected so far. Um, I don't like playing it that way as much. I like playing it like the board game, which is where you keep your points concealed from the other players, but you get to see how many points you have. I don't see why you can't play that way with the card game. And we usually make a house rule that says you are allowed to look through your own victory point stack at any time during the game because you need to look back and see what colors you're trying to collect because that drives your entire strategy. I mean, otherwise you're turning this into an unnecessary memory game on top of the already deep strategic tactical decisions you're trying to make in the game. And then you have to add this memory thing to remembering your victory points. I just think that's unnecessary. So highly recommend our house rule. Always you can look through your own stack of colors that you've collected, but nobody else can see them. The final action you have available is your one-time power play card, which is called a catastrophe card. Each player starts with one of these, and you have to decide the one moment in the game that it makes sense to play this. That uses one of your actions on your turn. That card gets discarded from the game at that point. A catastrophe card simply wipes out one card that's already been played to the table. You cannot play your catastrophe on a card that has a leader on it. You cannot play a catastrophe onto a ship and you cannot play a catastrophe onto any of these treasure cards at the top of these columns. Now later in the game these treasure cards can be swapped with other cards and you can never play a catastrophe on those cards either. So you can't play a catastrophe on these topmost cards in the column, you can't play a catastrophe on ships, and you cannot play a catastrophe on leaders. So otherwise any open card out there is fair game. For example if there was a card merging two kingdoms up here you could catastrophe that card and that would break the kingdom up into two separate kingdoms or you could just catastrophe one of these cards it would remove that card from the game and then all these cards shift upward and I'll talk about some other situations where you might want to play a catastrophe card later in the video when I go over these other concepts first let's talk about these ship cards now the ship cards are similar to the monuments in the board game so if you're familiar with the board game the ships act the same way and the way these ships work is anytime a player creates a string of four of the same color Color in a column. So for example, if I add a card to this column, I now have four red cards in a row here. I get to make that into a ship if I want. And I would take the lowest four cards here, remove them from the game, and take the ship card that matches that color. So there's one ship card with red on it. I would replace that in this column. So there is a ship there now. 
Now, this ship will stay there for the rest of the game. So if another player comes in and makes another string of four red cards, they don't get to move this ship. This ship is there. Any other strings of four red cards will not turn into a ship. So you might notice here, all the ships have blue and then they have one other color. So that means that anytime you make a string of four blue cards, you can create any one of these three ships. You can choose. But if you made a string of four green cards, for example, you would have to choose this ship to replace them with. Anyway, that's how you create ships. Another quick rule is that you can only create a ship after you play a card into the kingdom. So for example, if this was the setup, there's three blue cards here, a red card, and then another blue card. Let's say on my turn, I play my catastrophe card to knock out this red card. Now that shifts this blue card up. I have a string of four. I do not get to immediately make a ship. I have to first play a card from my hand into that column. So I could play a blue card here for my next action. Now I've created a string of four. Now I can turn that string of four into a ship. So you can't create a ship from a catastrophe card. You can only create a ship from placing a card into a column. And that is in the finest of the fine print in the rule book. And I did just learn that when I created this tutorial. I have been playing that wrong the entire time. We used to play where if you catastrophe a card and it shifts up and makes a string of four, you can make a ship. But according to the rules, you can only make a ship after you use the play a card action. Now, why do you want to build these ships? Well, once these ships are built, they're going to spit out a free point at the end of each player's turn, as long as you have your leader in that kingdom. So as these ships get built, these kingdoms become much more valuable and desirable for the other players to want to get their leaders in there. Let's show you an example. Let's say it's my turn. I'm the archer player. Okay, I've already taken my actions. It's the end of my turn. I have my blue leader in this kingdom, and I have my red leader in this kingdom. And this kingdom also has the blue-red ship. At the end of my turn, I get to score a free blue and red point because I have my blue leader in here and I have my red leader in here. I have to have those cards in my hand at that point to be able to score them. So I could take another blue card from my hand, add it to my victory point pile, and take a red card from my hand and add it to my victory point pile. That happens after I take all my actions. And a very important thing to note is the black leader does not scoop up free points from the ships. So you know how the black leader, you know, gets all those points that fall through the cracks when you add cards to the kingdom. The black leader does not act as a joker, so to speak, in the case of the ships. The ships only give points to the active player at the end of their turn and only in the colors showing on the ships. And you would get one point per leader per ship that matches within that leader's kingdom. After you score all your points from your actions and from your ships, at that point, you draw your hand back up to eight cards and it's the next player's turn. If there were any conflicts that happened during that round and other players had to spend cards, they would also replenish their hands up to eight. You always start your turn with eight cards in hand. Now I think would be a good time to talk about those conflicts. Conflicts are a big part of this game, as well as the board game. And in this game, every time two leaders of the same color end up in the same kingdom, you have to resolve a conflict. There's two types of conflicts, and this is sort of the most important thing to wrap your head around in the game of Tigris and Euphrates, as well as this card game version. There are internal conflicts and there are external conflicts. These conflicts get resolved differently, so it's important to understand which is which. Let's talk about internal conflicts first. An internal conflict happens when one player adds a leader into a kingdom where there's already a leader of the same color. You can think of this like a revolt within the kingdom. You know, there's already a leader and then another leader comes in and tries to overthrow that leader. Now, the rules for resolving an internal conflict conflict are very easy, but let me just show you an example. It's much easier to see how this works. So here's the example. The uh, vase player has their black leader in this kingdom here. I'm the archer player. It's my turn. Okay, I'm going to place my black archer leader in the same kingdom, and now we have to immediately resolve this because remember, you can never have two leaders of the same color in the same kingdom. I am the attacker because I placed it, I initiated it, okay? So I have to determine my attack strength first. So 
Anytime you resolve an internal conflict, you always use red cards. It does not matter which leader colors are fighting. You always use red cards to shore up your attack strength. So if I place my uh, black leader here, I can add as many red cards from my hand as I want, and that becomes my attack strength. In addition to that, I get to add one more to my attack strength if my leader is on a red card and a red card only. Now these treasure cards up here would count for that, so if I put my black leader up here, my attack strength is one for this red card, and then however many red cards I want to add from my hand. So let's say in this example, I place my leader here, we're having an internal conflict, I, my attack strength is one, plus I'll add two more red cards from my hand. So I show that to my opponent up front. I am the attacker. I am initiating this internal conflict. My attack strength is three. The defender only has to meet that attack strength in order to win the conflict. So they just have to come up with an attack strength of three. Now their leader is not sitting on a red card, so they don't get that extra plus one. So they would have to have three red cards in their hand to add to this conflict. Let's say they do. They play those three cards, and now they win the conflict. When you win an internal conflict, first you get to take one of the red cards that was played in battle as a point. So the winner of the conflict takes one of these red cards, adds it to their victory point pile. Then the opposing leader has to remove their leader from the board and back into their supply. And then any other red cards that were played out here, these just get discarded from the game. So it's pretty easy to resolve internal conflicts. The result is the same whether the attacker or the defender wins the battle. It's just the defender only has to meet the attacker's strength. Now let's go back to my example here. Let's say I added these two red cards. My attack strength is three. Let's say my defender does not have three red cards in their hand. Then then they can just choose to play no cards to the battle and essentially just forfeit the battle. In that case, they just take their leader off the board. I, as the attacker, get to score one of these red cards that was played into battle and then the other discarded. So again, it works the same way. It's very easy to do internal conflicts. Now the strategies don't immediately reveal themselves until you sit down and start playing the game, but let me show you a little more complex example of a strategy I like to use. So let's say my opponent, the vase player, has their red leader in this kingdom, right? And I am thinking about getting my red leader in there to oust their red leader. But first, I'm going to sort of try to deplete their hand of red cards. So the first thing I'm going to do, their red leader is already in there. I have a ton of red cards in my hand. First, I'm going to play a red card into this kingdom. They're going to get to score a red point because their red leader is there. So they're going to take a red card from their hand, put it in their point stack. Now, I'm going to play my red leader onto that red card that I just played. So that's going to up my attack strength by one already because I'm on a red card. Now I'm going to immediately, you know, that causes an internal conflict. So now I'm going to add all these other red cards to my attack strength. Now I have an attack strength of four. I added three cards, plus I get one for the red card I'm sitting on. My opponent is down a red card because I just made them score one. And I'm hoping that they don't have four more red cards in their hand to match my strength. They do not have four red cards in hand, so they cannot fight against me. They retreat from the conflict. So they move their leader off the board. Remember, the winner always gets to score one of the red cards that was played in the conflict. That goes into my point pile, and the rest of these get discarded from the game. So I just ousted their red leader using a little bit deeper strategic uh, maneuvering. And there's a lot more of this type of maneuver you can do in this game and that's why I love it so much because again this is just a deck of cards with colors but there are so many little subtle things you can pull off just like that and we haven't even talked about the external conflicts yet now before I get to that I want to reiterate internal conflicts are always fought with red cards don't forget that that's easy to forget so even if the blue leaders are in an internal conflict it's always fought with red cards and don't forget to add plus one to your strength if your leader is sitting on a red card in an internal conflict. That's pretty much all the rules for the internal conflict. After you take your entire turn, so after you do your two actions, at that point, 
and only then do you refill your hand back up to eight, and your opponent will also refill their hand at that moment as well, back up to eight cards. So any players that are involved in conflicts, you have to wait till the active player is completely done with their turn, and then you refill your hands back up to eight. So that's something that's kind of easy to forget sometimes, because you might start a conflict on your first action, and then after the conflict, you're tempted to draw back up to your hand limit of eight. Well, no, you have to take your second action first, then refill your hand. So just remember those things. Those are things I see happen over and over again. As many times as we've played this, it's easy to forget sometimes. You don't refill your hand till the very end of your turn. Anyway, let's get into the external conflicts. These are my favorite part of the game. Now, external conflicts will happen when two kingdoms merge. So let's talk about how you merge a kingdom. I briefly touched on this earlier in the video. The kingdoms can only merge at the top here. So remember, we left a space when we dealt these first uh, treasure cards out. We leave a space between them. The kingdoms can only merge in these gaps right here. So if on your turn, if you play a kingdom card out onto this gap, that will immediately merge these two kingdoms. Now it's important to note, you cannot merge two kingdoms unless there are at least four cards in each of these columns that are merging. So in these two adjacent columns, there must be at least four cards in each one. So if this column here has three cards in it, this column has six cards, you cannot place a card in here. You first would have to get this column up to four cards, then you could merge right here. And one quick thing I forgot to mention when I recorded this, uh, when you merge two kingdoms, the card that you merge with, the card that you place between the kingdoms, does not generate any victory points to any of the leaders. So those merger cards are just merger cards. They do not generate points. Okay, now back to where we were. We just played a merger card, and we're about to start an external conflict. Now, if there are two leaders of the same colors, now part of this bigger kingdom, you have to resolve this conflict. This is called an external conflict. So the external conflicts always happen from a card being played that merges two kingdoms. The internal conflicts always happen from a leader being played within a kingdom. So I'm going to set up an example of an external conflict because this is easier to teach with an example. Now I'm the archer player, it's my turn. I have my green leader in this kingdom over here. The vase player has their green leader in this kingdom over here. So on my turn, let's say I play a blue card between these two kingdoms. Again, you can only play cards between kingdoms at the very top of the column right here. And don't forget, there has to be at least four cards in each of these columns that are merging. So I'm going to play this blue card here. As soon as I play this, I have to check and see, are there two leaders of the same color in this new, bigger kingdom? There are. It's the green leaders. They match. That cannot happen. And that is what triggers an external conflict. Now, if vase player didn't have their green leader here, if I play this card here, there is no conflict. It just merges the kingdoms. So then nothing really happens. You just move on. But because there are two leaders of the same color, now we have to resolve the external conflict. So in order to do this, we have to play this blue card face down between the two kingdoms until we resolve the conflict. Now, remember in the internal conflict, I said you always fight with the red cards, no matter which leaders are in conflict. During an external conflict, the leaders that are in conflict determine which cards you fight with. So in my example here, green leaders are in conflict, so I have to play green cards from my hand to add to my attack strength. In addition to that, you also get to add every card on your side of the kingdom that matches your leader. So in this example here, green leaders are fighting, so I get to count all the green cards on my side of the kingdom. That would be three. So my attack strength is three plus however many green cards I add from my hand. So let's say I add two more. My attack strength is now five. Now, just like in the internal conflicts, my defender has to match that strength of five. They also get to count every green card on their side of the kingdom. In this example, they have two green cards on their side of the kingdom. So right now their attack strength is two. So they need to be able to add three more green cards from their hand in order to match my strength. They do not have that, so they're going to add no cards to the battle. I win the battle or the conflict. 
So in this example, the first thing I do is I get to score one of the cards that was played into battle, just like the internal conflicts. So now I get to take one of these green cards that was played and add it to my victory point stack. The loser has to remove their leader from that side of the kingdom, and now the winner gets to take every color card on that side of the kingdom that was just fought. So the green cards come to me into my victory point stack. It's important to note you do not get to take cards if there is a leader on that card. So once again, in my example, the vase player lost the conflict. I, as the archer player, won the conflict. I get to take this green card from their kingdom and place it on my victory point stack. I cannot take this green card because the lion has their leader on that card. So that stays out there. But I do get this green point onto my stack. And don't forget to shift these cards up in this column. After all the conflicts are resolved, at that point, I come back to where I was initially, where I merged these kingdoms, and I flip this card over and return to play as normal. And then we proceed to my second action of my turn, which might be adding another card to this kingdom and scoring a point, or maybe I want to cause another internal conflict with the lion player or something like that. So you just have to remember... You know, after you do both actions, then any players involved in the conflicts return their hands back up to eight cards. And then you proceed to the next player in clockwise order. Now let's get a little more complicated with the external conflicts. That was a very simple example. What if you merge two kingdoms and there are multiple leaders of the same color in that new bigger kingdom? How do you resolve that? Well, let's set up an example and show you that. So in this example, Vase has their blue leader over here. Lion has their blue leader over here. Vase also has their black leader over here. And I, the archer, have my black leader over here. So if I play a card in between these two kingdoms and merge them, there are going to be two external conflicts happening, one between the black leaders and one between the blue leaders. Now, I, as the archer player, I'm the active player. I played the card that merged the kingdoms. I get to decide which order to resolve these conflicts. So let's say I want my opponents to battle each other first. So I, I'm involved in the black conflict, but let's say I want to see how the blue conflict plays out first. So I say the blue players are fighting first. The way this works is the attack Attacker is the player closest to the active player in clockwise order around the table. So in this example here, the vase player is directly next to me, and the lion player is two spots away from me clockwise. So the vase player would be the attacker in this external conflict between the blue leaders. So Vase would first count their blue cards on their side of the kingdom, which is two. Then they could add cards from their hand, blue cards, to shore up that strength. So let's say they add one blue card. Their attack strength is three. Now the lion has to match that. They have one blue card on their side of the kingdom. And they're going to add two cards to match that strength. So lion wins that battle. So lion first gets to take one of the played cards, add it to their victory point pile. The rest of the played cards get discarded. The loser, vase player, has to take their leader off. And then Lion gets to collect all the blue cards on Vase's side of the kingdom that aren't occupied by another leader. So in this example, they would get this blue card into their victory point supply. Now, we shift this card up, but we still have another conflict to resolve, which is between the black leaders. So it's me, the archer player. I'm the attacker now because I started this whole thing. And then it's the vase player. They're the defender. So now I first count all the black cards on my side of the kingdom. There are three. I'm going to add two black cards from my hand. My attack strength is five. The vase player has only one black card on their side of the kingdom but they have four black cards left in their hand and they play those four black cards. They match my attack strength and they are the winner. So I have to retreat from this conflict. I take my leader off the board. The vase player gets to take one of those black cards that was played in battle and adds it to their supply pile. The rest of the cards that were played in the conflict go away. Those go out of the game. And now the vase player, as a reward, gets to take all these black cards from my side of the kingdom. Now it's important to note these red treasure cards at the top of the columns, these are fixed to the top of the columns. So there is a way to get these, but it's not in a conflict. I'll go over that in the next part of the video. But just know that if red leaders are fighting, you do add these red cards to their strength on their side of the kingdom. But 
the winner does not get to take this topmost card from their kingdom and place it in their supply pile. So you just have to keep that in mind. Similarly, in the internal conflicts, you could have your leader on this treasure card, and that would give you that plus one strength in the internal conflict. So the treasure cards still act as red cards, but you cannot remove them from the game in a conflict. The only way to get these treasure cards is through another method, and that's really the only rule left I have to cover in this tutorial, so I'll do that in the next segment of the video. Real quick, one more thing with external conflicts. Sometimes you might have a conflict where, you know, once the winner of the conflict takes all those color cards from the loser's side of the kingdom, it might break up a kingdom because those merger cards, like if there was a blue merger card up here and there was a conflict between the blue players, the winner takes all these blue cards on this side of the kingdom. They also take this blue merger card. Well, that breaks up this kingdom into two separate kingdoms. And now all of a sudden, there's not a conflict between these two players, for example. So it might happen where the order in which you resolve the conflicts forces another conflict not to happen. That's a very rare case, but it does happen from time to time. So just keep that in mind, especially when you're the active player and you want to start an external conflict. That order in which they resolve really matters sometimes. And one final little note about external conflicts is any ships that are involved in kingdoms that are fighting do not count toward battle strength. So the colors on the ship cards, you don't add those to your uh, conflict strength your attack strength, your defense strength. You just completely ignore ships during conflicts. Now, what I like to do to remember that is whenever a ship is made, we usually put these ships sideways just so they stand out a little more. I wish the ship cards looked a little bit different from these other cards because they do blend in sometimes. So I like to just flip them sideways so you can easily see where the ships are and you know not to count those for battle strength and you never take those as a result of winning a conflict. You never can put a leader on those. You can never catastrophe a ship. And you also have to remember to give those points to the active player in that kingdom where the ship is. So it helps if you just flip those ships sideways when they get built. They do count toward the eight card maximum in the, in the column though. So just remember those little things. Okay, there is one more thing to learn and that is these treasure cards at the top of these columns. The treasure cards are red with the dragon symbol on them. If you can manage to get these cards, into your victory point stack, these can count as any color you need for that set collection scoring. So these are very valuable, but how do you get them? This is where your green leader comes into play. Now it's a little confusing because the treasure cards are red, but you need your green leader to get them. So it's a little weird. You just have to wrap your head around that. But just remember, your green leader is going to be how you collect treasure cards. So how do you get these? Every time a kingdom merges and there are two two or more available treasure cards in that kingdom, if your green leader is there, you get to take all but one of the available treasures. Let me show you an example. Let's say the board is set up like this, and we have this kingdom here, and we have this kingdom here. Now, I'm not going to set up any conflicts because that's just going to make this example longer, but let's say I play a card right here to merge these kingdoms. I have my green leader over here, Okay, I merge into this, this kingdom, which has two treasures available. So now there are three treasures available and my green leader is there after these kingdoms merged. Now, first we would resolve any conflicts like, you know, I said, but I'm not gonna do that for the example. So first things first, resolve any conflicts. Then if your green leader is there, you get to take all but one of these treasure cards if you have red cards in your hand to swap them with. So in this example, I play a card here, I merge these kingdoms, my green leader is in the kingdom, there's at least two treasure cards available, I can take all but one of these treasure cards. I have two red cards in my hand, I get to choose which two treasures I take, let's say I take this one and this one, I just have to replace those with red cards from my hand. The treasure cards go into my victory point pile 
and these red cards stay fixed to the tops of these columns. Now, if there were leaders on these treasures, you can still do this. The leaders stay out there on these new red cards. And whenever you swap for these treasures, you just have to treat these new red cards the exact same way, being that they are fixed to the top of these columns and they can never be catastrophed. They can never be removed from the game in a conflict or anything like that. But they're no longer treasure cards. They're just red cards. You just have to remember, you get all but one of the treasures, okay? So in this example, I got two of the three. So if there would have been four treasures available, I could have gotten three of the four if I had enough red cards to get them. But if I only had one red card, then I could just get one of the treasures because you swap a red card for the treasure card. Just remember, you can only take the treasures that are within your kingdom where your green leader is, and it only happens after two kingdoms merge. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of external conflicts between green leaders because people want to get those treasure cards. But you first have to resolve the external conflicts. Then whichever green leader is left standing has the opportunity to swap red cards for the treasure cards. So I know you're ready for this tutorial to end, and there's only one more thing to talk about, and that is how does the game end? Well, at the end of your turn, if you go to replenish your hands back up to eight cards, and there's not enough cards in the supply to replenish all the players back up to eight cards, then the game ends immediately. Or if there's only one treasure card remaining, then that player finishes their turn and the game ends right then and there. So one treasure card left, or not enough cards left to replenish everybody up to eight cards. Simple enough. At that point, you proceed to final scoring. We already talked about this. Just refer back to that earlier chapter of this video to learn about the scoring. Cards left in your hand are worth nothing. It's only the cards that you accumulated to your point supply pile. Just organize those by color and find the color that you had the fewest of. That is your score. Again, the player with the most points wins. If there's a tie, then the tied players would compare their second fewest color, and whoever had the most of that color would be the winner. And if it's still a tie, then they would compare their third fewest fewest color and whoever had the most in that color would be the winner and so on. If it's a tie after you compare all four colors then it's just a shared victory. And that is how you play Euphrates and Tigris Contest of Kings. Wow that was a lot to cover and I tried to keep the tutorial as short as possible but I really wanted to be thorough in this. You know there's just not a lot of content about any of the Tigris and Euphrates games. There's all kinds of re-implementations of those games and there's just not a lot of good detailed tutorials out out there. Um, if you learn the rules to this card game, you can jump right into the board game. There's a couple key differences, but they're so very simple, and you'll have no problem transitioning into the heavier board game, which just takes a little longer to play, has a few different strategies to it because you have more of a length and width grid to think about with your kingdoms, whereas this game is much more linear. You know, you can focus on the kingdoms. They only join at the top of these columns, so it makes it a lot easier to visualize in this card game. The biggest difference that I can see between the card game and the board game is how you score your points. So in the board game, when you place a tile into a kingdom, you automatically get to take the points from the supply. It's just wooden cubes to track your points. In the card game, your cards are also your points. So you play a card into a kingdom, you also have to have that color card in your hand to be able to score it. Now I really like this in the card game because it really helps new players develop a strategy. And even me, like I'm a seasoned Tigris and Euphrates player and I still have trouble developing a good strategy in that game. But in the card game, I feel like the cards that you have in your hand sort of direct your strategy a little more because you have to be able to score them from your hand. So for example, if I only have one blue card in my hand, I'm probably not going to place my blue leader out and then play a blue card because I don't have another blue card in my hand to be able to score it. Whereas if I have a lot of green cards in my hand, well, maybe I want to start by placing my green leader out and play a green card so I can get a green point, kind of get my engine going a little bit. It sort of helps you get started into the flow of the game because you have to pay attention to what cards you have in your hand. Whereas if you're brand new to the board game, you might just look at your hand of tiles and be like, okay, I have a blue tile, there's my blue leader, I'll just add it to that kingdom and get a blue point. And that's it, and that's great, but then it's like, what did that really accomplish toward my future? Future plans. You know, it's hard to grasp that in the board game, whereas the card game, I think, just helps you visualize that a little better. Now, again, I will say again, I still prefer the board game because it's a longer, heavier experience, but the card game is so, so versatile. 
It's so good for new players, for seasoned players, if they want a quicker play time. I would even argue the card game plays better at two players than the board game does. So these are just some things that I've noticed because I've played both of these games a lot and you know I will never get rid of either one of these. I think they both belong in my collection. But if you don't have either of those games, definitely start with this card game. It's so much easier to find on the secondhand market, at least as of right now. And I just, I really recommend this. Um, as a board game, compared to all the other board games in my collection, I give this a 9 out of 10. And that's a crazy high rating for just a card game. You know, like most card games, I usually rate about an 8 to an 8.5 if I really like it. But this is probably my favorite card game in my whole collection. And, you know, as a card game, obviously I'd rate this a 10 out of 10. But as a board game, it's a 9 out of 10. There's a couple things, you know, minor issues I have with it. Um, mainly the luck of the draw. I feel like does affect you a little bit more in the card game than it does in the board game because you have to have those colors in your hand to be able to score them but like i said earlier that sort of drives your strategy you just have to work around your card draws a little more in this card game but other than that i don't really have any major gripes um, sometimes i think the card game ends a little too soon a little too quick i just want a bigger experience when i'm playing this game sometimes you just get going you just get rolling and then the game ends and that's fine for a card game but that's that's why I prefer the board game because it's a little heavier, it's a little bigger, and it doesn't end too quickly. Uh, another thing I like about the board game is the points being kept secret from your opponents, but you are able to see your points, and that's easily remedied in the card game. Just look through your stacks. I don't know why your victory point stacks have to be kept hidden from yourself. That seems ridiculous to me, so just look through your own victory point stacks, and you guys can decide if you want to have open points where everybody can see everybody's points. I like playing where the points are kept secret from your opponents. But those are all minor, minor things. So overall, highly, highly, highly recommend Euphrates and Tigris Contest of Kings. Tigris and Euphrates, one of the greatest board games ever created, especially considering it was made in 1997, I think. And then this card game came along in 2005. So obviously there have been some more recent re-implementations of Tigris and Euphrates using hexagon grids. I prefer the square grid of Tigris and Euphrates and this card game also basically uses a square grid as well so I just think that's a little bit easier to visualize personally but I would love to know have you played Tigris and Euphrates or any of its re-implementations what's your favorite edition of the game and have you tried this card game does this look like something you would like or maybe you like the board game better and why I love to read all those types of comments and if you like learning about these undiscovered games make sure you're subscribed to this channel click subscribe right here on YouTube like the video comment share this with all your board gaming friends and tell them to subscribe as well that's the best way to help my channel because as long as my subscribers keep going up i'm going to be motivated to keep producing content like this if you want to help the channel further there is a paypal link in the description below you can donate any amount you like buy me a cup of coffee so i can stay up late and produce more videos like this uh, it's not necessary i don't expect that but everybody who has donated seriously i really really appreciate that um, i just you know i don't really expect that but whenever you you do it's very humbling that you guys like my content that much and it really does motivate me to make more videos like this so thank you and um, i will be back with more undiscovered games from my board game collection coming at you on the next episode hopefully another two weeks from now or so i'll have another episode for you and until then make sure you check that description below to make sure i didn't make any mistakes in the video any rules clarifications things like that i always include that in the description below thanks for watching everybody i will see you on the next video